tell you that you in your life will imitate somebody. The question is, who will it be? Now, we see and we have heard this statement that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. And I would say that imitation is also the sincerest form of worship. And let me show you what I mean by that in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Go ahead and turn there. All right, if you're there, say amen. If you're watching on the screen, say amen. If you don't have your Bible here, well, uh, bring it next time. All right, verse 1, here we go, follow along. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. He says from the get-go, number one, Imitate God like his child. My text begins with therefore. The word therefore is tying what he is about to say to what he has just said. In fact, these two verses serve as somewhat of a hinge. It, it closes up the previous section talking about the different clothing, spiritual clothing that we are to wear as followers of Christ. And then he's going to hinge and transition to another topic, imitating God. But he is wrapping up that previous idea with, listen, if you would just imitate God, I wouldn't have to be telling you all of this stuff, is basically what he's saying. But he says, imitate God. God. The word imitate is mimetize. We get our word mimic from that. If you mimic someone, you are literally mirroring what they do. How many of you have gotten into the mimic battle with one of your children where they repeat after you over and over and over again? I have found that the mimic battle never ends well for the child. Because somebody gets mad at the end, amen? And so we have this idea of mimicking. It's the idea of exactly what someone else is doing, we do that as well. And in this text, we are told that as a follower of Christ, we are to mimic, we are to imitate God. We are to follow him. We are to do exactly what he does. And he says here, and he gives us an illustration at the end of the verse. He says, as dearly loved children, as beloved children. The image that he's trying to portray is that of a child and his father. Now, I have no doubt you've heard the phrase, the apple does it far, far from the tree. Because innate in all children is the idea of mimicking and imitating our parents. How does a child know how to follow Jesus? Many times they imitate their father in his following Jesus. By the way, fellas, if you're not concerned about Jesus in your life and you're okay with that, and you may be headed to hell with that, I want you to turn around because your children are following you there. They're mimicking you. They are imitating you. Mom, same thing with you. They're mimicking. They're imitating. Uh, they, they are following you. I, I can't tell you how many people say, well, when you're preaching, you look like your dad up there. You have the same mannerisms. You have the same way of saying things. That's right, because as a beloved child, I am mimicking my father. And he's saying, if God is your father, then you need to mimic him and imitate him in the same way that a child would imitate his earthly father. Now listen to what the Bible says. This is in 1 John 3, 10. John writes, This is how God's children and the devil's children become obvious. Whoever does not do what is right is not of God, especially the one who does not love his brother or sister. We have in 1 John 3, he is talking about and describing a life that is characterized by faithfulness versus a life that is characterized by sin. 
And he talks about the one whose life is characterized by righteousness. That is the one whom we know is the child of God. And the one whose life is characterized by unrighteousness, we know that they are a child of the devil. Now, we all know that we are saved by grace through faith. Amen? That we do not earn our salvation. That we are not good enough in our own self to be considered righteous and to be considered reconciled with God. We do not be good in order to be saved, but because we are saved, we want to be good. Y'all get where I'm saying? Now, this does also, this does not say that once you are saved, that sin is completely eradicated from your day to day. In fact, if that were true, 1 John 1, 9 would not need to be in the Bible. Because there, a believer in Christ... John the Apostle, he said, if we confess our sins, including himself in that, after he was saved, what that means is there will still be sin in your life because we are still in the flesh. We're not talking about the battle that Christians have with sin. We are talking about, in this text, someone who names the name of Jesus but then rejects the leadership of Jesus with his or her life. We're talking about someone who may have raised a hand we're talking about someone that may have walked an aisle and, and prayed a prayer. And, and then later in life they say, you know what? I know what I am supposed to do to follow Christ, but I reject that and I'm not going to do that. And their lifestyle is characterized by rebellion against God. I do believe in once saved, always saved. If you were truly saved. There's a caveat there. It's not just, well, I did the deed. I, I, I raised my hand. I walked the aisle. I prayed the prayer. I'm good, and now I can live however I want to live. No, my friends, if you were genuinely saved, you will imitate God, and the world around you will know it. But if you claim the name of Jesus, and you live like the world, you are imitating your father, the devil, and the rest of the world will know it. That's why we have here this admonition, this command, this encouragement for us to be diligent, to imitate God. A genuine follower of Christ will reflect the one that he or she is following. And I know what you're saying because I thought this myself, uh, but God is God and I am not. God can speak and the universe comes to being out of nothing. I can't really do that. How do I imitate God? How can I imitate Almighty God if only God would become a man and show me how to imitate Him? Imitate God like His child, and secondly, imitate God like His Christ. We know that Jesus himself is God incarnate. If you want to know something about God, look no further than Jesus Christ. He is God. Look at what the Bible says in verse 2. He says, and walk in love as Christ also loved us walk in love this idea of walking it describes and encompasses all of life where you go what you do what you say what you think the attitudes you have how you treat others all of life is encompassed in this idea of walking and it says that we are to walk in what love we hear about this word love agape this word is an unconditional, self-sacrificing love. Not a self-serving love, but a self-sacrificing love. 
it, this type of love elevates the needs and elevates the one whom we love. So, if I love my wife in this way, then I elevate the needs of my wife. And I love her because I've made a conscious decision to submit myself and sacrifice myself for the sake of her. That is exactly the type of love that he says that we are to have. And it says this is the type of love that Jesus had. This love is the Christian virtue. How do I know that? Listen to Matthew chapter 22 and verse 36. Teacher, which command in the law is the greatest? And he said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. Everything else builds off of the idea of walking in love. What that also means is that if you remove walking in love from the equation, you have just taken the bottom pieces out of the game of Jenga that you've been playing. And when you take the bottom pieces out, all of the other edifice of morality falls down. This is the foundation off which all of Christian morality and all morality in the world is based. The idea of loving God and loving one another. By the way, what this tells us is if we love God, we will love one another. And if we are not loving one another, it's an indication that we are not first loving God. And so we are told we are to walk in love because that's what God did. That's what Christ did. Look at what it says. As Christ also loved us. And how did he love us? It says right there, and gave himself for us. How do we know love? This is love. That one laid down his life for his brother. How do we know that God loved us? For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. But God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. My friends, Jesus, God himself, stepped out of heaven, lived a sinless life, was tried and executed on the cross for no crime, was buried was raised on the third day. And why all of that? Because he who knew no sin became sin so that we who had sin could have it taken away. We see here the love of Christ. Christ gave of himself, sacrificed himself so that we might live. That is love. Notice he says at the end of the verse that this giving of himself, this love, was a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. It was a sacrifice of worship. This verbiage takes us back to the Old Testament temple worship where they would sacrifice. They would sacrifice animals. They would sacrifice uh, food. They would not sacrifice food, but they would burn up food and they would pour out an offering before the Lord. And whenever they would uh, bring the animals they would sacrifice, they would take those animals and they would slit their throats and pour out their blood. And then they would take the parts of those animals and they had a large altar there. And the priest would take the pieces of the animal up on that large altar that had a fire burning underneath it. And they would put a little bit of Tony's on there. And they would put, uh, they would stick it on that, above that fire. And as that fire was burning up the sacrifice, it was barbecuing that sacrifice. 
where the altar was set up. I've told you this before. The altar was on the eastern side of the temple. And the Holy of Holies was west of that altar. And the predominant wind was an easterly wind that would blow across the sacrifice and would blow the smoke of the sacrifice and the aroma of the sacrifice into the Holy of Holies where God's throne on earth was at that time. It would blow that aroma in. And if the aroma was pleasing to God, then that meant that God accepted that sacrificial gift. What he's saying here is that Jesus' act of love at Calvary was not just an act of love, but an act of worship. When you love someone, you are not loving them just for them. You are loving them for Him. Let's be honest. There are some people that are hard to love. Look, y'all quiet on that, but I know you amen in me. You know what I'm saying. I Don't act like you're all pious in here. You know. There are some folks, it's just hard. It ain't easy. But you're not loving them for them. You're loving them for him. And when we walk by love, what we are saying is we belong to Jesus. And we are worshiping Jesus. Jesus by walking in love. In that early time when we had Jesus in the first century, the way that they had school, there were a couple of ways, but one of the ways is they would have a rabbi. And uh, the rabbi was a teacher, and the pupils would gather around that teacher. And the teacher would go somewhere, and they would go with him. And he'd go to another town, and they'd go with him. And he would teach, and their responsibility was to memorize verbatim the teaching of the rabbi. So that once they graduate, they could become a rabbi. They would gather pupils as well. Those pupils would live with them, would travel with them, would eat with them, would would go everywhere with them because they were trying to memorize what he was saying. And then one of them would become a rabbi, and on down the line it went. Do you know what they called the pupils that followed the rabbis? You probably do. What were they? disciples someone who names the name of Jesus and is a Christian is a disciple of Christ what that means we are a follower of Christ learning from him and repeating what we have learned in our daily life and if we are not imitating his Christ we are not being his disciple Listen to what the Bible says in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Paul writes, Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by uh, by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It was his love that led to God's worship and to the glorification of Christ. How is it that you and I can show this love? Is he asking us to go to the cross? Yes. heard it earlier Luke 9 23 then he said to them all if anyone wants to follow after me let him deny himself take up his cross daily and follow me for whoever wants to save his life will lose it 
But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. For what does it benefit someone if he gains the whole world and yet loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me in my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and the holy angels. He says, if anyone wants to imitate me, he will give up himself, take up his cross, and follow me. He will give up the rights to his own life. The opposite of that is to hold on to that life, but he says, what does it profit a man to gain and to hold on to the whole world yet forfeit his soul? And the answer is nothing. Nothing. What does this look practically? Philippians 2, 1 through 4. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, make my joy complete by thinking the same way, having the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourself. Everyone should look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. How else can we love? Matthew 25, 34. This is a long passage. Bear with me. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or without clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for And he will also say to those on the left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you didn't take me in. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. Sick and in prison and you didn't take care of me. Then they too will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or without clothes or sick or in prison and not help you? Then he will answer, I tell you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. They will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. My friends, we are not saved by taking care of people, but because we are saved, we will imitate God and we will take care of people. Do y'all see the difference? You do, yes? So when you're evaluating your life, you ask the question, does my life imitate and mimic that of Jesus Christ? Or is it a selfish, self-centered, what's in it for me? My friends, your answer to that question reflects the answer to another question, do you know Jesus? Jesus in the garden knew that the cross of Calvary was before him. He was burdened. He was struggling. And as he prayed, he told God, not my will, but in old King James, thy will be done. The ultimate imitation of Christ is that we are broken to a place to where we say, not my will, Lord, but thy will be done. Not what I want, but I want what you want. Not what I feel, but what you've taught me in Scripture. Not what my friends are saying, but what the Bible teaches. Not what the world is encouraging, but 
but with what this good book tells me. Not my will, but thy will be done. There's no clear area in which someone can say, not me, but he, than when we realize that we are a sinner and we are broken by that realization and that reality that we are a sinner, that we cannot go to heaven on our own. In fact, we deserve hell because of that sin, that we recognize that Jesus can save us if only we would humble ourselves and trust Jesus as the Lord of our life. Within this room, there are many here I know who have never trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Oh, they, they trust the church. They'll trust their morality. They'll trust some event that they did. They'll trust the baptistry getting in the water, but they're not trusting Jesus. Be imitators of Christ who was willing to set aside his pride, to set aside his self in order to submit to God. I invite you to do the same. Would you bow your heads and hearts with me? In this room today, there are some who claim the name of Jesus but are not concerned with imitating Him in the least. Friends, let today be a day of repentance for you. But there are many in this room who have never given their life to Christ. They may be sitting on the wings today. They may be on the floor, under the balcony. You may be up in the balcony right now. It may be a senior adult. It could be a child, a teenager, anything in between. But I want you to know that today you can imitate Christ by trusting Him and beginning that relationship with Him. The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And so today you can call on Him to be the Savior and the Lord of your life. If you'd like to know more about First Baptist Lafayette, visit our website at fbclaf.org. There you can learn about various ministries, see a list of coming events, and watch or listen to messages. That's fbclaf.org.